Thank you for getting in the room uh, very promptly. I'm Nick Bjornfeld. I'm Head of Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, here at Imperial. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Graham Hughes's inaugural lecture. Um, the lecture is being recorded uh, and then will be available online. So uh, please mute your phone and try to minimize any peculiar noises you might uh, otherwise make. Um, <laughs> if our evacuation um, alarm goes off, then please leave the room by the exit there and here um, and um, make your way to the entrance hall. Uh, and then out to the front of the building, turn right and gather uh, at the base of the Queen's Tower. Um, after the format for this is that after a few words from me, uh, Graham will deliver his lecture, and then there will be a vote of thanks from uh, Professor Paul Linden. Uh, Paul is the GI Professor of Fluid Mechanics at Cambridge. Uh, he's a mathematician specialising uh, in fluid dynamics and will be very well known to those working in the fluids area uh, across the college and I can see many uh, people from beyond the department working in that area uh, here at the moment. Uh, he's made major experimental and theoretical contributions relevant to oceanography, meteorology and environmental and uh, industrial problems. The uh, tradition for our inaugural lectures is that we don't put any questions to the lecturer while we're uh, in this room. Um, however, you are invited to a drinks and canopies um, reception on level two of this building uh, immediately following the lecture, and that will give you uh, an opportunity to um, discuss uh, and question what you've uh, heard this evening. So I'd like to just say a few words about Graham, not saying too much because I know that he's going to be talking a bit about uh, his history in this area. But his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees were from Auckland in New Zealand. Then he came to the UK and uh, carried out a PhD at Cambridge and was then a postdoc at Surrey. Uh, then he went back south to Australia uh, and at the Australian National University, he held uh, a series of fellowships, including a prestigious Australian Research Council Future Fellowship. Then he was an associate professor there for a couple of years. Um, along the way, he won many prizes, and he's given many uh, important invited lectures. Uh, he joined us as a professor of environmental fluid mechanics two years ago. Uh, he's also director uh, of education for our Energy Futures Lab here at Imperial. Uh, his research is largely focused on buoyancy-driven flows uh, applied to a broad range of applications. So, Graham, please come and uh, come up here and deliver your lecture, Fun with Flows, the Fluid Science of Healthy Environments. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, it's disconcerting looking at a picture of yourself for too long, so we're going to get rid of that right now. Okay, so I would, it's great to see so many people here. Thank you for, for coming. I'd like to, to tell you tonight about some of the research that I've worked on over some number of years now in the area of environmental fluid mechanics. And I'd like to, to start by kind of probably taking away some of the title in that healthy environments are something we would aspire to, but actually they're quite hard to, to define. But we have a pretty good idea of what unhealthy environments might be, and we don't really have to look very far or very hard as to, for some examples. So in London, for example, you can look at a recently released uh, news report from The Guardian, um, and find that London survived a month of this year without breaching its uh, air pollution limits that are prescribed for the year. Well, that's better than last year when it only took six days into the new year. But it's not a problem that is limited to, to the UK only, or even Europe, but it's very much an international problem. And we're also not restricted to thinking about um, 
pollution or our environments in the atmosphere, but also um, perhaps in, in water environments. So where our drinking water comes from, here's an example with an algal bloom that we really would like to avoid. And we also use our waterways for disposing of waste, and there's clearly a, a problem in the, the second example here. On, on an even larger scale, the, the kind of environment that we're setting ourselves up with, uh, with climate change, is, is also worrying. And this particular map shows the, the temperature anomaly uh, from last year in 27, 2017 relative to the mid-1900s and a mean taken over about 30 years. And the dramatic feature of, of this map is the amount of warming at high latitudes and particularly in the, the Arctic areas. And it's that, that warming that is leading to the, the kind of ice loss that we, we know of now. And the effect that this might have on the oceans is something that is, is clearly an ongoing area of investigation. And ocean warming and ocean acidification are two, two facts which are kind of uh, problematic for the marine ecosystems such as um, corals. So this, this is a personal or lecture in which I'll give a personal perspective of research in these areas today. And I've spent a lot of my career working um, in ocean dynamics, and so I'm actually going to use quite a number of examples from, from that tonight. But this is an integral part of understanding future climate change. But also, I'm going to, to look to some examples from areas of work in, the, in renewable power that I've worked on. And in one sense, this is one of the major causes of the, the, the climate or the changing climate that we now see. Now, specifically, I will talk about um, concentrating solar thermal energy there. And the third, the third example that I'll use is that of the built environment. It's a place that we, we spend most of our time. We actually consume a very large proportion of our total energy demand in conditioning that environment. And that's predominantly through heating and cooling. And so in a place like Imperial, one of the attractions for me to, to come here is really that I can work in all of these areas and other areas that I'm not going to talk about tonight. But the one unifying theme here is, is fluid mechanics, and it's an enabling science to, that sits at the core of these applications. And so if you like, my take-home messages today are summarized on this slide. There's three of them. One is highlighting the fundamental role that the study of environmental fluid mechanics can have in doing all of these things that we might want to do with environments. I also want to, to highlight the, the strong synergies that we can make use of between what might look to be three really quite diverse and disconnected applications. And it's really, I think, a message I want to also emphasize is that that process of looking between those areas opens up a many important opportunities for, for research that I think is really quite exciting. So first of all, um, you'll get the impression there's a bit of a bathtub theme to, to this lecture. And so what can we learn? Well, surprisingly, most of what I'll say, we, we could learn by looking at our everyday bathtub. And perhaps in this case, uh, the water's started to cool and you want to add some some hot water to heat it back up. The dynamics that are involved here, we're going to see in examples of the oceans, in examples for the built environment, and examples um, from solar thermal energy. And I'm going to really address three questions today, uh, which, again, have a, a personal nature to them. So why have I chosen to focus on flows that involve variations in density? And what is actually fascinating and challenging about studying these kinds of flows? They're called density stratified flows. And what do I see as the future research opportunities in the area? Every, every one of you in the room now is probably generating heat at 
order 100 watts, maybe if you rush to get here, a little more. And so if we are able to visualize the, the, the flow or that's rising fr from that heat source, as is done here, you can, you can actually see that heat rising. And it would be a very interesting picture from where I stand right now. So that's, um, that's a human plume. And it places a load, as you can imagine, um, in this room on, on the cooling system. But we, we choose to condition our environments. And obviously, at this time of year, most of the time, we might choose to, to heat. But I can assure you that by the end of the lecture today, the, the cooling systems will be uh, in, in full operation here. And it's those kinds of activities and things like you might do in an office building, uh, use computers, uh, there may be solar gains, uh, and so on, which create air of a range of different temperatures. And it is a very, very natural thing to find in those environments a whole range of variations in fluid density or air temperature. If you were to take a thermal map of a city, and in this case, it's, um, it's a map of Atlanta, and I would guess in the summertime, the, the scale goes up to, to order 50 degrees Celsius, then you can see a very wide range of temperatures that uh, is, is on the surfaces in this built environment. This is going to be driving <coughs> flows. And if you want to understand the, the urban environment and perhaps the, the flow of pollution or the distribution of pollutant, then perhaps you have to, to think about these sort of processes. It's also very interesting if you uh, can actually see this uh, photo closely enough, you can pick out which way the sun is shining because the cooler areas cast a sh or correspond to areas of shadow from the buildings. And from the temperature scale here, you, you can see that you could have variations easily of 30 degrees. At an even larger scale, if we look at, in this case, a global scale, the, the balance between incoming solar radiation and long wave re-radiation means that the Earth's surface or, tends to be heated at equatorial and uh, sub-equatorial latitudes, but further away towards the poles, there's a net cooling. And that, that leads to a very, very strong forcing on a global scale. The other thing that I should mention that creates or is very influential in creating density differences is the water cycle and the fact that we evaporate water, we, uh, we precipitate water has consequences in terms of the, the heat transfer and also creates differences in salinity in the oceans. And freshwater rivers um, add fresh water. So not only do you have in the oceans uh, a lot of variation due to, to temperature, but also salinity. So back to the bathtub, I think if I was to summarize all of that, I'd say that density variations are really something you cannot get away from in, in most environments. But what do they look like? In this case, I'm showing a section through the Atlantic Ocean. On the, the left-hand side is uh, the towards the South Pole, the North side, um, or the North Pole towards the, the right-hand side here. And density is shown here increasing in color, or the color variation from the red towards the blue at the top. And the striking feature of this is that the lightest waters are sitting at the, at the surface levels, and the densest waters are to be found um, at the, the base. And in fact, this section cuts through the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and you can see that the, the very densest waters uh, come up against the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and don't pass over it very easily in, in this section. As, as I showed with the radiation balance uh, a couple of slides ago, we are applying cooling at the surface and heating at the equatorial latitudes. And we might want to know, well, what does this do? It's fair to say in the oceans there are also other forcings that are in operation. The, the action of the wind stresses exerts a torque on the ocean surface, um, and that applies in, in both hemispheres. 
and the, the tides tend to move water back and forth. They interact with topography, um, and that is shown there. There's also the fresh water forcing that I, I mentioned, and that typically takes place at the surface. So the oceans have to respond, um, or they generate a flow that responds to this forcing. We have to take heat, an excess of heat from the equatorial latitudes and move it towards the poles. Now I'm not going to talk about the detail of how that happens, but we do create dense waters, the very densest waters in fact, at the pole, poleward margin, so around Antarctica and in the Arctic basins. That water is, doesn't want to stay there because it's dense and so it falls to, to the bottom. And that's why you can see this, this strong signature here of the very densest waters filling up the, the bottom. And the question is, how do you maintain this kind of density structure in the circulation? So, i.e., we leave this running. Why, why don't the oceans fill up with this very densest water? So that's a question that I'm going to, to come back to answer. I should also say for completeness, the action of the wind stress on the surface <coughs> introduces some, some complicated flows. It drives, drives an upwelling in the interior, but I'm not going to, to concentrate on the details of that today. So the, the summary point there from the bathtub is really that flows which have variations in density um, are going to have quite interesting physics. So broadly speaking, Heavy fluid wants to sink, and light fluid wants to rise. OK, well, what about the, the built environment? Let's think about the, the global oceans being a bathtub. What we've done in the built environment is really to turn it upside down. So let's proceed to do that. So we turn our domain upside down. It doesn't quite look like a building. But we're engineers, so we can, we can make it look like a building. And you can expect in a building that you have density structure in the interior. So in this space, there'll be temperature variation. And there's a very complicated uh, way in which the flow is thermally forced. So there may be a series of heat sources, just as we all are. There may be um, some places where we're losing heat, where, where there's cooling. And it can lead to very complicated flows between connected spaces and indeed exchange with the outside. So a lot of the, the physics that we learn about the global oceans are exactly applicable here. The third application I said I would talk about is a solar thermal applications. And there are, there are two different types of systems shown here. One is this parabolic dish. And what it does is to, to concentrate incoming sunlight to, to a very central thing called a receiver here. And we want, in these systems, to extract that or high temperature heat out of the system. The, the photo on the right here shows a, a different kind of system. It's a central placed tower in which you focus incoming sunlight um, from a field or a farm of mirrors, if you like, on, onto that space. And this is what happens when the sun is, is on, on this dish. The dish has to track the sun so it can be inclined to the, the vertical. And you can see the, the area here which is collecting the sun. It's concentrated the sun to um, an average, in this case, of a couple of thousand suns. So it's actually very high temperature and very, very intense sunlight. In this other example here, uh, if you could just see the black square here, this is standing inside it. And there's a person here for scale, and it obviously wasn't operating at that time. You really wouldn't want to be there. So in the case of the, the solar thermal example, where's the bathtub? Well, again, we've uh, We've taken something that looks like that geometry. We've applied a bit of engineering to it. And it, we've taken a receiver, that bit at the focus. And in general, it might be inclined at some ang angle to the vertical or horizontal. And what happens in, in a general sense is incoming solar radiation um, 
hits this interior, there's some re-radiation re re due to the, the heating up of the surfaces. What we want to do is take as much heat out of this as possible, and so we try and harness the energy. And because we have hot surfaces in here, there's fluid that is driven by the density differences. So there's a heat loss due to convection or movement of, of the air. And all of these three effects uh, come into balance. So, moving on to the second part of this, what can we, or what do I think is really interesting about these kinds of flows? In general, they're density stratified because of the, the, the density structure to the flow. They're, they're typically turbulent flows, and they, they or mixing arises because they're turbulent. If we want to, to mix our bathtub up when it's got a bit cold, we, we don't sit and wait, or we don't put hot water in and sit and wait for it to, to become uniform temperature. You have to put your hand in and stir it. So what, is the, or what might that turbulence that you create look like? It might depend on how soon you look, look at the flow after you've stirred it with your hand. But if it was very actively stirred, it might look something like this. And what you can see in this structure is some, or what you can see in this picture is some quite large structures, but there's a lot of very, very fine uh, structure within that. And the, the lighter fluid here, or the lighter colors, <coughs> correspond to less dense fluid the darker colors correspond to, to more dense or colder fluid. If you stirred your bath up and waited some time, it might look more like this, where there's, in general, lighter fluid sitting above denser fluid, and maybe there's some residual turbulence. This, of course, happens in the interior of the oceans. And rather than it being your hand which stirs up the interior of the oceans, there are a whole lot of processes which do that job for you. And the, exactly what they are is not important, but um, this diagram in indicates uh, the, the existence of those. And a, a very, very eminent oceanographer in 1966, Walter Monk, asked the question, well, let's think about turbulence in the deep oceans, and let's think about what rate of mixing is required. So how strong is the turbulence in this case? And to, do, to make this estimate, what he realized is that you have dense water sinking to the bottom. Well, what goes down has to come up somewhere. And in order to, to balance the, the dense water or the heat, which really cold water, which is brought upwards, the, remember, the oceans are not filling with cold water. In order for it to be in a steady state, it means that you have to be mixing heat downwards at a rate which comes into balance. So he used this piece of information to make this estimate. And what he showed is that the rate at which you, you mix heat downwards due to this turbulence is about 1,000 times the rate of molecular conduction. So if the, there was no motion and no turbulence in the ocean interior, you would only get heat to move around by molecular conduction. So the turbulence that is in the ocean is, is doing a very effective job. There's one problem. When, when you went to measure or make direct measurements of that level of turbulence, it was about a factor of 10 smaller than the theoretical estimate. So a major question in the oceanographic field for, for 50 years or so is where, where is that mixing? And I want to describe today some of the, the work that we did to, to address this problem. Um, and I will describe an experiment which is an idealized experiment. And it takes really half a, um, half a global ocean, or if you like, one hemisphere. And we apply heating at the surface over part of that, uh, part of that experiment and cooling over the other half. And the, the region that's simulated in the, the experiment that I'm going to show you is, is something like this box. But what you actually see in the video is shown by something like this, uh, this dark frame. And this is what happens. So here's our net cooling, if you like, the polar region. Here's our net heating, something like the equatorial region. 
And the flow has this very, very interesting structure to it. There's what I will focus on today is, is this sinking region. It is a, it is a localized and turbulent entraining plume. And you might like to think of this as something like an underwater avalanche. And the, the really important finding about this is that it has global importance. In the oceans, these, these things have a scale on the order of a kilometer. And we're thinking about a structure like that in the global oceans, which have a scale of 10,000 10, kilometers or more. So this is an absolutely tiny structure, but it's globally important. So this is what it might look like if you could go and observe it. Here's, here's an avalanche, and it's highly turbulent. As the avalanche flows down the slope, it, it entrains air into it, and what you end up with down here is a mixture of, of air and snow. So an underwater avalanche in the oceans, uh, so how does it work? Well, we would suggest that this helps to resolve some of the the, the question over where the missing mixing is. If you think about um, some water in the interior at some level, this, this little red blotch, then under the, the previous mechanisms or the, the previous way of thinking about it, the way in which heat could be taken from some level to, to greater depth is due to the turbulent stirring. And that, that was the, the only pathway open to it. But now, with an, the possibility of an underwater avalanche, we have a, another mechanism. And that is heat from this level, if you like, can be entrained into the underwater avalanche, and it can be carried to, to great depth. And so instead of having to, to have turbulence stirring and carrying heat all the way to great depth, you have a second pathway. And it's a pathway that is uh, much faster than by having lots of little turbulent eddies stirring, stirring heat downwards. You can carry it directly to, uh, to great depth once you entrain it into your avalanche. And so that was, that was really the insight for us from, from this piece of work. And so in terms of our, our bathtub lessons, I think there are, there are a couple here. One is the, the physics that govern these kinds of flows can be very surprising. And the second, the second and really important one, I think, is that there are a very large range of scales in these flows. In the global oceans, we're thinking about not only um, an avalanche that might have the scale of a kilometer or so, but the turbulence in that has scales down to, down to a millimeter or a few millimeters. And yet, we need to resolve those scales as well as the very large scales. So this is an example of a flow which happens on a very small scale, but which has global consequences. And if we want to, to not only model the flow, but the transport of tracer, and you can think here pollutants in, in a room context, then we need to capture all of those scales. So, as I just said, similar processes occur in the built environment. And we can see the, the avalanche or the plume here. Uh, there it is, or, and there's another one here. And we might think, well, yes, um, we, we do care in these cases about where the source of, of what is a pollutant from a wood fire goes and what it does. But how many of us would, would recognize that this process of, of cooking, so putting in our home a combustion source as well as what is a very effective source of particulates is an unhealthy thing to do. It's something we do every day. Something that has perhaps got a bit of press very recently is, well, that's, that was combustion, but what about the, the other products we use in our home? For example, um, cleaning products, or in fact, uh, things like furniture or, or perhaps paint or floor coverings. These are all sources of, of chemicals that get released into our homes um, and our environments on perhaps different timescales. 
What would, might we do in response to, to get rid of those pollutants? Well, we'd be tempted to, to ventilate by opening a door or window. And in this video, you can get some impression of what that flow might look like. So we've opened, opened a door or window here. If this is an indoor environment, you can see that uh, perhaps relatively cold air might flood into the room. But there might be an awful lot of pollutant that is still trapped in that room. And what, and what if these, we had a connected geometry? So maybe this is a simple room, but maybe we actually have adjacent rooms or, in fact, multiple stories of a building in which what happens in one area will affect um, another area. So the, the physics and the complications that can arise here uh, mount up very, very quickly. Other effects that we might want to consider here are what happens when external wind uh, is blowing outside, for example. What happens when the, the source of pollutants is, is not constant in time. We're not cooking all the time. Uh, perhaps the, the floor coverings or the furniture that we use uh, is degassing over, over some period of time. How do we understand those transient effects? And also, how do we understand the effect of transient thermal forcing? Our rooms are not always in a steady state, or rarely in a steady state. And temperature variations um, diurnally overnight and in the day uh, mean that the way that our, our, we have ventilation happening in our, our spaces is completely affected by these effects. So I think the, the point from the bathtub there is really that the question about tracent or tracer or if you like pollutant transport is a very, very pertinent one in, in a density stratified flow. The, perhaps the, the last and quite major point um, from the bathtub in this section is really that these flows, um, energy in these flows is absolutely central to to understanding them. And I'm going to, to give you a couple of examples of, of this, but in a density stratified flow, energy is consumed, it's transported, and it's converted between forms. And an understanding of that is absolutely important to understanding this kind of flow. So an earlier slide, I, I left it with a question of how is the density stratifi stratification maintained in the circulation, and I pointed to the role of underwater avalanches as uh, a, certainly a contributor to explaining what is happening to the mixing in the oceans. Well, so here we are. This is part of my answer. It's not the, it's not the sole mechanism that can operate, but the oceanographic community did not really accept this argument in very readily, and so the feedback that I had was, well, well, Graham, you know, this is what really happens in the oceans, and this is why. So this is what happens from an energy perspective. We all know the box on the left here gives the sources of energy to drive the flow, and the boxes on the right here are the way in which we consume that energy. And so this is representing what happens in the global oceans. The winds blowing across the surface, supply 21 terawatts. OK, it's a very large amount of energy. The action of the tides, uh, we can attach a figure to that. And this goes into the box where it drives a circulation. And where does that energy go? Well, some of it goes to, to what I'm going to explain in a little more detail, what we term mixing. The rest of it you know, is dissipated. So we generate motion in the oceans. And friction uh, basically ends up accounting for a large fraction of this energy. So this, this is the diagram which was uh, used to say, well, look, it's very interesting what you've done, but actually we don't believe it because this is what happens. So I want to, to before moving on to explain this a little further, I just want to think uh, about this analogy that may help to explain what mixing and dissipation does for you. So let's consider you had the stratification, such as the picture of the oceans that you saw, 
where the density increased with depth. And what you want to do is, is redistribute the waters a little in, in that stratification, whereby you might want to interchange some denser waters with some lighter waters. And the mechanism you've got to do this is a, a pulley which has friction. So you're going to, to try raising denser waters on a fric pulley with friction and lowering lighter waters on this pulley. So you're going to, what you're essentially going to do are two effects. One is you're going to redistribute the center of mass through doing this. And that's what we can think of as mixing. But because the pulley has friction, you're going to have to put in a lot of extra work, and that's going to cost you energy. And that's, that's what happens in this box. So despite this input of energy, only some of it is going to make it into this box, and the remainder is going to be dissipated. That's the, that's the kind of level of the physics that is, is really all that's needed for the moment. So I referred to this idea of an underwater avalanche, and what change does it make to this picture? Well, instead of the figure that we had here, it's something which can be much smaller because you're, you're essentially able to do this more efficiently. So that, that's the first change. And I should say that uh, these next few slides really uh, summarize uh, several years of work. And uh, so I apologize if I skip over some things here. The, the second modification is that we're applying heating and cooling at the surface. And this was previously said, well, it, it doesn't provide any energy whatsoever. But you can see perhaps very easily the problem with that. If you're going to cool it part of the surface, you're, you're generating dense water, which is at the surface. It doesn't want to stay there. So it's going to fall, and that releases energy. If we extrapolate that from, from this experiment that we, we did to the scale of the oceans, then I can put a figure on what heating and cooling supply to the ocean circulation. And it's small, but it's non-negligible. The third modification that I'll make to this diagram is one of requiring thermodynamic consistency. And in fact, what we were said, this is what happens, or what we're told, this is what happens. It's actually thermodynamically inconsistent. So that's a pretty big deal. And this is why. The winds and tides, which were proposed as being the sources of energy which drives the circulation, well, what, what do they do? If you imagine that you had your bathtub here with hot water above cold water, and what you did was to apply winds and tides to, to that, that's essentially taking your hand and, and mixing up the water. So what it's going to do is destroy density differences. So your density structure is, is gone. And the important point, the headline point here is, this leaves you without a mechanism to maintain a ther thermodynamic disequilibrium. So what do you need? If you're going to apply winds and tides and, and mixing to your bathtub, and you want to maintain some kind of density structure, then simultaneously with that, you need a source of hot water in your bathtub and a source of cold water in your bathtub. And all of those things have, have to happen simultaneously. The effect of this in this energy diagram is we can very clearly say what this figure here is. And it has to be exactly the same um, as the amount of energy you supply through heating and cooling. And that bound is something you can show very rigorously. And the remainder of the energy really has to come down this route and be, be dissipated. So that's, that's a story, an interesting story, I think, from the oceans. Well, what happens, what is the role of energy in in the other applications I referred to. I want to just take a couple of slides to describe the, the application of concentrating solar thermal power and describe a project that I was involved with that 
it was really quite fascinating. So it was a collaborative project, and I certainly didn't have the skills to do all of this simultaneously. But what we did is optimize the design of, of this unit here, the cavity receiver which sits at the focus. And that requires um, a, coupli a coupled design which takes into account the, the optics of uh, concentrating dish. You need to take into account radiation. You need to take convection into account. You need to take into account the way in which you harness that energy. And that's done with a heat transfer fluid that, that runs through this receiver in some way. You also need to take account of the materials that you can use because you're dealing with very high temperatures. And then there are other practical considerations. The diagram on the right here is the design we ended up with. And in the lower half of this, this was the modeled temperature profile over the interior surface. And the upper half just shows the incident flux that you'd predict. The end result of this model was we predicted that we should be able to, to lower the losses from this by about 50% or more. In fact, <coughs> this is what was built. You can see the, the, kind of the tubes here which form the interior surface of the receiver and through which you circulate the heat transfer fluid. And this is this receiver then installed on the, the parabolic dish. And the, the tests that were, were ran with this showed that something, we had something which was 97% efficient. That is, we collected or only lost 3% of the incident energy. So that, that was actually quite a big deal because what was previously achievable with state of the art was more like about 93% of the energy. It might still sound like quite a lot. But those extra few percent, the big gain that that gives you is it cuts the capital cost of the system. And so that's, that's a really big deal in this. I want to, to quickly jump back to uh, some other work that was motivated from the oceans, but which has much more general applicability, applicability to all of these applications. And really the process of having to, to explain for the oceans uh, this original diagram and try and what I would argue is correct it. Um, there was one other assumption in this diagram that was quite interesting. And that is used in almost every single ocean model. And that is to assume that 20% of the energy that you supply into generating motion and turbulence results in mixing. And that was originally used to connect the number that was in the, the box here and the box here. So we thought, let's, let's look at some of the processes which result in turbulent mixing and try and understand uh, what percentage of energy is actually used. Oops. So here are a string of different processes which we, we looked at. Um, for without going into too much detail, this is a thing called a density current. This is a thing called, so there's a flow of dense <coughs> fluid underneath a lighter fluid. In this case, there's, there's an exchange of less dense and more dense fluid. And there was intense turbulence that you could see that was generated. In this bottom case here, there's, there's a density stratification interacting with some topography. In this case, there's the outline of a black hill this is a, another general case. It's called Rayleigh-Bernard convection. It's something you end up with whenever you heat um, a layer of fluid and you cool at the top. And this diagram at the top represents um, a plume in a space. So if you, were to, if you were to turn that upside down, it's a bit like one person being in this room. And all of these processes generate mixing. And we were able to look at the amount of energy that was consumed of these. Broadly speaking, low efficiency and moving clockwise, increasing efficiency. And so in these cases, about half of the energy ended up being dissipated and a half of it was used for mixing. The final case in the center here was, was one that we found remarkable. 
100%, almost 100% of the energy that you supply to, to drive this flow ends up being used for mixing. It's a flow, although it looks as if it has turbulence in it, and it does, very little of that energy is used to drive the turbulence. So without worrying about the detail of that, I think the conclusion I'd say is that the reality is very, very different and much more complicated to the common assumption that was used in this case. But it's actually interesting to, to think about this, this whole swathe of processes in the context of applications such as the built environment, how we might manage um, bodies of water, such as water drinking reservoirs, um, perhaps industrial processes, and indeed things like heating and cooling of, of a space like this. So I'll move on to, to outline what I think some of the future research opportunities are in this area. And a big one, and a very interesting one, is the built environment. There are perhaps three, three pressures that make this, make this very pertinent. On average, in the developed world, we spend about 90% of our time indoors. And in doing so, we consume about 30 to 40% of our total energy supply in, uh, in those spaces. Predominantly, that's about conditioning our environment. And the third pressure is that, is in a global sense, people are mig migrating to urban centers. So it's exacerbating what is already um, a very big issue. How do we go about monitoring these spaces? Well, in a very limited way, I think, is, is often the answer. In many rooms, you might be lucky to, to find a, a measuring sensor on the wall. And in an urban environment, well, we're actually doing quite well, perhaps, in London. The, the key here shows you different kind of uh, sites for monitoring air pollution. A roadside, I don't think there's any suburban, um, but it's what's called an urban background site. And this is the network around this area of London. And you can see there, there's, there are a series of sites. But the question remains, what level of detail do you really need to, to understand the, the levels of air pollution in this environment? And I thought it was quite interesting to, to take some perspective here from, from the the history of ocean data and ocean observations. Order 150 years ago, this was really when some of the first data was collected on the oceans. And of course it was fairly limited, but it, it, it actually motivated a lot of research questions. And it wasn't until the 1970s when satellites started to give us a lot more information, but they were about the surface. And in fact, the early 90s, a major ship campaign where began to probe in much more detail the deep oceans. So our knowledge of that is, is relatively recent. Since 2000, a network of almost 4,000 floats, and this is where they are as of last month, have been deployed. And these floats are autonomous. They spend their time moving up and down through actually the top 2,000 meters of the water column. But I think the point is here, you can get some idea of what the, the coverage of data from this network is like. It is providing a magnitude of data that is exceptionally useful and it is, in fact, enabling a great deal of quite important research in this area. It's still true, though, that the very deep oceans remain relatively mysterious. So I think my message there is, what's going on in the place? places like the built environment. It would be very interesting to, to be able to have that kind of resolution and that level of detail. So I think some of the key, or op key opportunities in this area are to think about environment quality. I've talked a bit today about energy consumption, but what is really needed is to couple um, couple knowledge about energy consumption with things like pollutant transport, um, so determining air quality, and also thermal 
and acoustic comfort. So we're, if in opening our windows are we being subjected to noise that is we just don't want. So how do you manage all of those at some level competing pressures? Ventilation and tracer transport. There, there is a whole swathe of interesting problems to address here. Um, pollutant dispersion is, is an obvious one but the exchange between the indoors and outdoors. So you, we keep in the media seeing examples of bad quality, air quality outdoors. Do we open our windows or not? On the whole, it's probably a good idea too, but we just don't have the data to tell us what we should do. The effects of the wind outside, um, and depending where you are in a building in relation to the wind direction, the, that's also pretty important. Can we apply these ideas to urban design? So the questions about heat island effects uh, in a heat wave, that's, that's obviously a very serious problem. But also, what about our urban centres, or how do they change when um, we have diurnal variations in heating and seasonal changes? I also, uh, moving on into some examples from this, this area of renewable power. This is a very, very interesting plot. And I think it serves to highlight that solar thermal power has a very interesting future ahead of it. So what do you see here? On the, on the axis on the, the vertical is, it's actually a levelized cost. We can just take it as the cost of energy um, for simplicity. And in 2016 US dollars per electricity unit, kilowatt hour. And it's plotted against the cumulative deployment. And so why would that be important? Basically, the, the more we do something, the more efficient or the better we expect to get at it. So over towards the right of this plot, you would expect that costs of producing that energy had come down. And practice or observations often, this is actually a log, log plot. Um, and there are good physical reasons why you might expect that behavior. It's just an observation that often you follow a straight line in development. So on this curve, there are, on this plot, there are four different technologies plotted. The curve for photovoltaic panels, the curve for onshore wind, the curve for offshore wind, but this, the red curve up here, is for solar thermal power. And the reason I think this is, is absolutely fascinating is looking at where it's going. The 2020 figures are here are plots based on auction prices um, two years hence from now. And this is where solar thermal is headed. It's going to be competitive with current fossil fuels and it's arguably catching up some of the more established technologies quite quickly. And yet, it's only just begun to, to be deployed in, in some quantity. So I think there's a really, interesting, a really interesting future. Who knows what lies beyond that at the moment? And where are, where are those falling costs going to come from? The Department of Energy in the US has kind of plotted uh, where those costs lie as a function of what it is, so the receiver in the system or the power plant. These systems can also store thermal energy, and that's an important part of it. And the solar field, so the, the way in which you, you reflect the sunlight towards a focus. And all of these different components are projected to come down in cost. So the, the kinds of work that I've been doing addresses a couple of these. It, it obviously addresses the receiver because that's what we've been working on, but it also addresses the solar field because you can cut the capital cost. And in fact, arguably, that's where your main gain is. To give you some idea of some current projects on this, um, this, this shows some simulations of what behavior we might be expecting to be happening or the behavior we expect to be happening in the receiver. Should say this is an extremely hostile environment, so you can't just put a sensor in there 
in a traditional way, it's just going to fry. So we're reliant on modeling techniques to, to, to look at this. This is a numerical simulation which gives some idea of the temperature field. And you can see the red showing hot fluid, hot air trapped up in the receiver. That's what you want. And a laboratory demonstration which uh, the red fluid here is indeed trapped in this cavity, in a, you, but you can see an escaping plume. So the, the physics of that is we believe that we are happy with those. But how, or are there things we can do to, to try and cut down the losses? We've looked at application of something like what you might think of as an air curtain. Every time you walk into a building in the winter, you're going to get blasted with, with an air curtain from above. Can we apply a similar idea here? We've looked at directing a jet. It's a little different to an air curtain because, uh, because of the way it has to operate in the environment. It has to operate. But we've predicted that you can get 50% cut in the losses um, by using this kind of thing. And in the laboratory demonstration, we've directed a jet across this, this open aperture here. And you can see this extra red fluid trapped inside as a result. We're also thinking about applying this, these sort of principles to this second kind of system, which is where you have a central tower, this very bright, irradiated uh, part. And whether, at the moment, in this case, this is something like a, a vertical cylinder. So there's a huge area exposed for heat loss. So can we control, one thing we're working on is can we control the airflow in the vicinity of these surfaces to really cut down those losses? So. The built environment, renewable energy, and climate are kind of central motivations for the, the future research opportunities that I see. And, but essentially, I think in the examples I've showed you, I, I hope that you see that the understanding and the modeling of those environments is, is absolutely key. Being informed by observations is part of that. But for many cases, we're going to depend on improved parameterization, that is represent representation of the physics which happens at a small scale. Um, and we need to include all of these things. So I'll summarize with, with these few general points. And that is environmental fluid mechanics. I, I see it as really a fundamental science for understanding critical environmental problems. And that there are actually a number of very exciting research opportunities that if we can leverage the synergies that exist between, say, the three applications that I've showed you, but others as well, then it offers a lot of extra opportunities. And so the things we need to achieve are better modeling, design, prediction, and operation of these environments. And the sort of tools and techniques that we have involve collaboration between laboratory and numerical work and with observations. So I guess my, my parting point here is that really it's a critical tool to address challenges in climate change, energy, and water and air pollution. So the work that I've described today certainly wasn't done by myself. It's involved a, a large number of people over, over very many years. And so just acknowledge those people, you probably don't have time to read it. Um, the, the first part of the list here, people not at Imperial, um, and then since I've moved to Imperial, already entrained people who I'm very happy to work with. The, the funding for these sort of projects has come from the Australian Research Council, as, um, as Nick mentioned, a fellowship, but also some project funding um, Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and also from Foster and Partners. And with all of these things, you can never be great, more than grateful, or grateful enough for the support you receive in the laboratory. And so there are a number of people who, who don't get named on papers and, and so on, but they're absolutely key to what we do. I'd also like to thank uh, 
for the organization of the lecture today, Rebecca, who is still sitting up the back. She normally disappears. Um, but also the fluid mechanics section, who, who many of you had the chance to visit the laboratory. And also the Imperial Events team. It's important um, for me to acknowledge the role of the mentorship that I've had during my career to date. And these people, through in rough, roughly chronological sequence, um, Roger Noakes in New Zealand, Paul Linden um, in Cambridge, and since that time, Stuart DL also um, in Cambridge, Stuart Turner and Ross Griffiths at the Australian National University. And I can't thank my parents enough for, for the encouragement that they really gave me to to pursue education, and my wife, for, who is an unnamed collaborator in really a lot of this work, <laughs> and who I've dragged half, halfway around the planet. So to all of those people, I offer my thanks. So I, um, I realized the title of the lecture was Fun with Flows. So as a parting shot, I wanted to show you that they uh, that flows can be fun. I've spent a lot of time in the lab, and there may be a few people in the audience who watch the Big Bang Theory, so this might potentially be the inaugural episode of Fun with Flows and Flags. And you get to see here that this illustrates the connection between the Italian or the Irish flags and the Hungarian flag. So while that's playing, um, I'll leave that playing, and I'm done. So thank you very much. Well, it's uh, an honor for me and a pleasure to offer a vote of thanks to Graham for this uh, wonderful inaugural lecture. Uh, you can see why he's popular with students. Um, and I think what uh, you can also see is the very precision and clarity of his thought that he applied to these very complex problems. I guess I have uh, three kind of messages of my own from this lecture. And the first is, I think, that I was struck very much by the choice of problems that Graham has worked on in his career. And they're clearly motivated by making this planet a better and more sustainable place on which to live. To understand the physics uh, across a whole range of problems, I'm very pleased to see that he reads The Guardian. And, uh, <laughs> and his, uh, the social conscience, I can see, is very important to Graham, the way he he, he formulates uh, uh, and tackles the problems that he chooses. We all as academics can choose anything to work on, one of the wonders of the job, and I think it's a, a great uh, reflection on Graham that the problems he chooses, how the oceans work, how we live more comfortably in the built environment, how we produce renewable power, are really things that are very much along the lines of making this a more sustainable and better place to live. The second uh, thing I'd like to say is that uh, Graham is incredibly modest, modest uh, and uh, in particular he tackles these problems uh, which are extremely difficult to do um, and presents it in a way as though it's all pretty straightforward and you just do this and that uh, and it's all obvious and of course it is obvious after you've spent a huge amount of time and energy and applied your intellect to these problems which Graham clearly has done. Uh, and I think you could see that very much in the way he could weave all of these different themes together and see these interconnections across this wide range of, of topics. Um, and I think that just shows the intellectual uh, uh, capabilities and skill of Graham to, to isolate these, uh, these features from these very uh, complicated and interrelated problems. And the third thing I'd like to say, and I would, those of you who know me will know I'm going to say this, or probably, is that it's great to see laboratory experiments playing a big role in this kind of research. It's, uh, it's one of the subjects, I think, where you can tackle enormous problems in a bathtub uh, 
literally in a bathtub. In fact, most of the experiments we do are smaller than most people's bathtubs uh, and, uh, and, understand, and get handle on things that you cannot compute, that you can't solve the equations for in a theoretical way, and you can see these flows in the laboratory and then use that information to, to, uh, to develop models and to understand how the physics works. And I think Graham showed some lovely examples of that today, uh, of his uh, various flows. And this requires enormous amounts of ingenuity to do it as well as Graham does it. People can do lab experiments, but to do them and really to get to the bottom of these really complicated things, I think, requires uh, great ingenuity, great skill, lots of precision. All of this, you didn't see any of that. But that's what's behind all of this, uh, and it's very important. So I think it's just been a fabulous lecture, uh, and uh, I would like you all just to give uh, Graham another round of applause. Thank you.